Hello and welcome to The Trusted Advisor, a channel-focused podcast and video series powered by the Retail Solutions Providers Association. I'm Jim Roddy, your host for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Today on the podcast, we'll focus on how channel champions sell today with two experts who know a thing or two, or more like a thousand things or two, uh, in the business development uh, arena of our industry. Our first guest is George Mouché, a principal and the vice president of business development for RSPA VAR member, New West Technologies headquartered in Portland, Oregon. New West is focused on general retail and retail niche verticals, including a recent launch of Green Force POS software to serve the cannabis industry. George, great to be with you again. I'm here. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for having us. Yeah, I have to say, though, George, I'm, while I'm glad to see you, I'm having flashbacks because the last time you and I got together for one of these, it was a reseller panel for uh, RMH, an ISV uh, member of the RSP Association. And as we were talking, a spider came down right in the middle of one of your answers. So Indeed. if you notice during this, those who are watching on video, while George is answering, if I keep looking up, it's because I don't want to get invaded again. So I'll try to send you a visual cue. If you see any rapid blinking, you know, that... <laughs> <laughs> That'll be good. Yes. Yeah. Right. If I see that, make sure that I'll, I'll dive out of the way from the tarantula descending on me. So, well, Indeed. great to have you here. Our second Thank special you. guest is Chris Duffy, uh, the Director of Distribution Sales for RSP vendor member Star Micronics, where she's been a key part of their team for over 20 years. Chris is a past member of the RSP board and currently serves on the RSPA membership committee. Chris is also a regular attendee at the RSPA Inspire Conference. And so, Chris, oftentimes you and I have had conversations near a pool, you're wearing your sun hat, it's 85 degrees out. This isn't quite the same, but regardless, it's always a pleasure to talk with you no matter how we connect. Hi, Chris. Thanks, Jim, and it's great to meet you all and see you again once again and see your smiling faces. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to participate in your panel. Sure. No, right back at you. It's, it's great to see both of you. So, well, uh, let's get to our questions and I guess we'll jump right into it instead of setting things up. Uh, back when I was in high school, you know, as all history teachers do, they have you watch some movies. And I had a high school teacher, you know, when there would be some sort of romance scene or some long dialogue, he would say, let's get to the killing. So let's get to the killing and let's talk tactics first about how channel champions sell today. And so what I'm curious about is how you use or don't use LinkedIn and other social media. So, George, as we were preparing for this, you know, try to build out the bio, get as much detail as possible. I noticed you only have 10 LinkedIn connections. So I'm assuming that you really don't do anything on that platform. Now, Chris, on the other hand, has a ton of connections. And I know that because she and I actually have 449 shared connections alone. And so, George, I'm curious, do you use any social media at all to help you advance sales? Uh, now, personally, I may have a, a, a smaller footprint on uh, social media, but uh, professionally, we obviously do as a company. Uh, and I think in that context, uh, we leverage social media extensively, uh, primarily because it's become a very convenient medium for a lot of folks to consume information, especially if uh, you do a very targeted uh, vertical sales like we do. Uh, so not only do we focus on retail, we focus on a subset of retail. And so being able to connect with folks uh, socially and engage them the way they perhaps mostly engage is is people to lower marketing strategies. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we do use LinkedIn uh, extensively. Uh, more so, I'd say we probably use YouTube the most. Uh, YouTube perhaps has been the best uh, presentation tool because it continues to sell even when you're, when you're done selling. Uh, it continues to do the demos for you. It continues to do all your presentations. It gets your messaging out there. And uh, it's also a good tool for us to be able to get product messaging out. So uh, whether we do cross promotions on Facebook, Instagram, uh, or we're coming back and trying to connect that with instructional videos or, you know, what we've done for very specific market segments. Uh, you mentioned in, in the bio intro there about the cannabis industry. So if we had a very specific message for that, uh, then we would try to hit all the social channels just to make sure that uh, we can cover the bases. Got it. Thank you. If you don't mind me asking a follow up, like to what degree, uh, you know, how many YouTube videos do you have? What's the volume of it? Because I can picture other VARs and ISVs listening to this and saying, Man, that's got to be difficult to do, you know, to put how many do we have to, to put out there? Do you have any idea of the volume, you know, of uh, the videos that are put out? And then again, how you use them uh, individually to advance sales? We literally have hundreds. Uh, and we've been uh, pushing out YouTube videos probably since YouTube came out. Uh, we developed our first mobile app back in 2004. And so we had a little bit of a head start in 
uh, been able to get video messaging out there. And back then there was uh, limitations as to how long the video could be, the size of the file, et cetera. Uh, but we found that we could only be in so many webinars. Uh, we could only do so many product demos. And so when you're trying to get into a market segment that has literally hundreds of thousands of merchants who are your target audience, uh, you can't have an in-person engagement with them all. You can't be at every single conference. Uh, so we found uh, YouTube to be a good tool to be able to get uh, either snippets of content or like entire hour-long presentations about uh, product promotions, uh, the in-depth product demos about a solution with a very vertical focus. Uh, now we've actually put it back into making uh, segmented videos so that we don't have to you know, commit to an hour-long uh, a session just to be able to consume content specific to mobility and retail or, uh, you know, uh, cannabis media or whatever it is, uh, we have found ways to be able to give you a good digestible amount of information in five to seven minute bits uh, that are very easy to consume. And then you can be able to come back and, and, and consume an entire series uh, if you had the benefit of time. Got it. Great. Thank you for those details. And I can tell folks just using your phone alone um you know there's a lot of tools on there get the youtube app get youtube studio is what i think it's called and i'm sure the videos won't be as good as what you guys are doing at new west but to get you started boy those things they launch very quickly they have uh, editing tools that are uh, easy to use okay so uh, that's how george and new west use social media chris how do you use it uh, personally to advance sales and and uh, business development uh, at star well speaking a little bit about linkedin linkedin really has evolved to be a central stool that Tool that we're using in daily sales and marketing activities. We use LinkedIn to verify people, titles, companies, and even as a mechanism to clean up the database of the Gmail, the Hotmail, the Yahoo email folks. It's an avenue to target decision makers of a specific industry or location. Got so it. Like okay. Yeah, so you use it a lot of times as a, as a database. Is that uh, correct? Like you're checking your records, making sure you have the right people? We use that, and, and again, as a marketing tool, um, when we're targeting a specific industry or uh, a particular location. Um, so there's a lots of different ways how to use that for target marketing. I, if you can give some insight in terms of how you work, um, you know, like over the course of a week, how often are you in LinkedIn? Is it something you get into once in a while, or is it something like, boy, this is like a uh, you know right hand administrator? for me to what degree do you use uh to use linkedin to help you okay so personally um for my for my purposes i'm using it just to communicate with people um a lot of people want to stay in contact they prefer to a quick uh note through linkedin um from a sales connection okay but as far as a marketing is concerned you know they use it for you know other avenues as when they're building their campaigns out got it Thank you. And I can tell I was just using LinkedIn in these past 24 hours. The RSPA is uh, looking to gain more of a foothold in the cannabis industry. We recently launched a cannabis community. You know, very quickly, we're up to nearly 90 members of that. But obviously, we want to add, you know, folks who are, uh, you know, ISVs in the cannabis industry. Uh, somebody, Harry Brelsford from 420 MSP, had a post. He tagged me in it. There are all these people in the comments section who are people who were interested in. So I'm reaching out to them. Hey, we both, you know, connected on this. Can we have a conversation? And I've got conversations set up for next week and people reaching in. And again, totally free. You just have to be able to, uh, to pay attention. Like you said, George, go after those niche markets. You can use social media. So, okay, that's social media. That's kind of at a higher level. Now let's talk about lead gen. George, uh, you willing to share with us, what are your most effective lead gen tactics? Yeah, so here's where we try to strike a balance between uh, uh, the quantity and quality. Uh, so, you know, as you probably know, we, we service uh, uh, the high end of this, the small retail market and then the, uh, the, the lower end of the mid market. So we try to you know, stay within the five to about 100 store range in terms of retail uh, profiles. So to be able to get to some of those folks, uh, we have obviously gone to the industry events that they go to because that is traditionally where you will find the best bang for your buck, the most exposure, uh, because you're literally in the middle of where they gather. Uh, and so that, that has always been perhaps the best uh, avenue for us to be able to do that, albeit in pre-COVID-19 times. Uh, when it comes to the, the quality opportunities, because every now and again, you'll probably find a good handful of opportunities that could literally make or break your year. Uh, those we almost do exclusively by networking and word of mouth, uh, because we work uh, extensively within the channel. 
uh, being a Microsoft uh, partner. So we have a full network of uh, Microsoft partners, and then we also uh, position uh, two key retail applications. So we have, you know, Microsoft Dynamics 365, we have RMH. Uh, so between those two channels within themselves, we network extensively because we like to be in the middle of uh, engaging all the major players. Uh, because then they're aware of what we have that is new and coming, uh, what we uh, do for the other ones, who those who've not heard of us. Uh, so mm -hmm. those are primarily the major uh, mechanisms that we use to be able to actually get our, ourselves out there. And then in addition to that, we also do uh, a tremendous amount of uh, newsletters uh, because those are also very easy to distribute. Uh, they obviously have a very low cost uh, component to them. They allow you to just you know curate your message, uh, you segment your data. Uh, we have very good analytics. Uh, to be able to let us know you know th this message is really good for this market segment and so we only do very targeted newsletter uh, drops just to keep the engagement going and uh, keep folks informed about what's new and what's coming out in uh, coming weeks months or uh, fiscal years yeah and just doing stuff like that i know this sounds crude but it lets people know that you're alive right they see the logo even if they don't read it they're like new s new s right they at least know that you're still in business you're you're reaching out to them i'm curious george from a trade show standpoint do you personally attend those yourself or those split up among uh, other folks on your team to try to meet new customers? I know I try to attend just about every trade show I can, uh, which, you know, for better or for worse, it puts me on the road about half a year. Uh, okay. But it's, you know, uh, you know, what are you going to do? It comes with the territory. But yeah, we, yeah. we certainly don't miss a retail now event. Uh, we haven't missed one in many, many years. Uh, we also have not missed an NRF show in New York City in uh, decades now. Uh, and we do all the industry events. We do a lot of the Microsoft events, as you probably know. And uh, we also stick around with uh, the small mid-market retail, the RMH conferences and so forth. Uh, we have to be out there because in many cases, uh, there is a message that goes out if you're not there. Uh, so uh, we like to make sure that we mobilize everyone who is in a sales and marketing role within the organization to uh, really spread ourselves as far as we can uh, and you know whatever the budgets allow. And any tips and tricks, like what's a best practice that you have to prepare for a show that our our audience, our listeners can say, why well, I should do that? Is there anything in particular you do to, to be as effective as possible at those shows? Absolutely. I'd say before you uh, an in-person event, you really have to strategize about what objectives do you have for that specific show? Uh, what are you really looking to get out of it? Uh, are there target folks, uh, prospects or customers you want to bring to this event? So that way there could be some advancement of a business opportunity or the creation of a new business opportunity or maybe learning of a new venture or market segment that you previously have not serviced. Uh, because now, as you can imagine, COVID-19 has really taught us uh, to be a lot more uh, aware about you know, markets and trends and, and sustainability of business and being able to venture into places that would otherwise have been considered risky. But you know, prior to any event, preparation is really the key. You have to know exactly what you're going to do on day one, day two, day three, what do you hope to really walk away uh, with from that event? And if you don't do that, there's really no point to attend. If you wait to strategize at the event, you're doing it wrong. Yes, exactly. You don't just show up and wander from booth to booth, or if you have a booth, you don't just get there and say, oh, come on, everybody, come into my booth. Yeah, there's way more work, way more outreach uh, beforehand. So great, great. Thanks for that, George. Chris, I'm curious, what lead gen tactics have been most effective for stars, resellers, and software developers? What have you seen? Okay, well, since face-to-face -face events went dark, we really needed to invent, reinvent the way we acquired our leads. Our CRM has been really a resourceful tool, and Jim, we've talked about CRMs for many, many years, and it offers a mechanism to deliver your messaging. Targeted campaigns have proven great ROIs, but they need to be targeted and focused at resell with a reseller and a software developer focused in a specialized vertical or at a department head and at a department head. 2020 really drove us to enhance our website by simply adding call to actions or CTAs to drive and attract some leads. Stars catalog also evolved as another lead source as we expanded our hardware bundled solutions. And for developers, we really created specific web pages to extend support for integration, white papers to educate use cases, best products in specific industries and verticals. And Acton has been a great tool used to track visitors and captures products and services of interest, which then in turn equal leads that we can send out to the team. Social media has been a great lead generator with LinkedIn and Facebook delivering the message, um, delivering the engagement. But 2020 really drove Instagram to fast track as the fastest growing lead generation platform for us. 
And I personally loved it because it was a modern lifestyle and a way to target, really truly target. Really? Well, wow. so there's a, a lot in, in that answer there. I'm curious, I guess, going from the most recent Instagram. Um, I mean, people like Instagram. I know I did talk to one ISV and they say they get the most engagement there. Um, I guess, what have you seen that's been uh, successful? Just simple messaging. Why, you know, why star? Why star this? You know, and having and staying in touch. And that we've really, we've really created quite a few followers. Got it. That's great. Uh, and then you also mentioned Act On. Uh, what is Act On? How can uh, what our, our listeners need to know about Act On? It's 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 um, works in conjunction with our um, C, um, our Salesforce. Okay, and so the information is all put in that database, and we can see you know it through our website. It gets tracked through into the Salesforce, and we can see you know who's looking, what they're looking at. So we early you know, um, so we can reach out to that person and engage with them. So that was a really good, good little pool. Yeah, and there's a real thing about you've got to be prepared on the back end or else you're not going to be able to keep straight all the all the different leads uh, that you have. So great. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. That was uh, very helpful. Again, there's a lot of opportunities out there for lead gen. It seems like the tried and true has been uh, trade shows, as George mentioned, any survey that I've seen. You know, trade shows uh, tend to be number one, but since you haven't had those, you can't just crawl under your desk. You've got to do the digital things uh, that uh, that Chris mentioned. So uh, let's talk about generating referrals. And so I'm curious how you consistently generate referrals. So I just talked with an RSPA reseller member and he mentioned to me, we were having a strategy session. He said they've been really fortunate to receive referrals organically over the past 12 to 18 months. And I said, well, what's your plan if that dries up? And he just answered, he said, I don't have a good answer for that. Can you ask me when we talk again in the new year? Like, I really don't know. These things have just kind of been happening. So I guess back to my original question, and George, if you can take it first, how do you generate referrals? What do you do to, to spark that word of mouth? I think the first prerequisite of uh, good referrals is good customer service. You know, like uh, the old adage, you know, uh, good news spreads fast, uh, but bad news spreads faster. Uh, so we try to make sure that we uh, put our best foot forward in, in the way we interface with our customers. Uh, case studies by far have probably been a very good avenue because, you know, uh, retail, especially in retail, retail is about relatability. You know, how you craft your message uh, for market segment. So, so someone who is a lawn and garden retailer in Oklahoma can be able to see a case study that you did for you know, somebody else in Texas and they can connect with that message. Uh, that will probably get them going more than anything else. So we do invest a lot of time in, in being able to actually feed that engine by creating as many customer referrals as possible. And so each time we have a positive engagement with a client, we proactively drive that so that way they can be able to get the word out, whether they put a good Google review or they put a, you know, a good review on our website or they go out there and put something on social media or they, you know, are, you know subscribe to be a, a case study reference customer. Uh, we get a lot more traction and mileage out of those engagements than virtually anything else. Now, naturally, uh, because we we network, you know, very extensively within the channels, uh, we are very prevalent in uh, the forums. So, as you probably know, uh, a lot of technology solution providers they really huddle constantly because they're they're trying to solve the same uh, problems out in the business communities daily. And so, if we engage with uh, like an RMH forum or a Microsoft Partner forum, uh, a lot of folks uh, will, will learn from some of the things that we've done extremely well. We'll learn from the mistakes that others have made, and some we'll share some of the mistakes that we've made so others can grow from those experiences. So those folks really end up, you know, being able to be very good industry partners really tightly to where they will always refer business back to you because you're engaging with them on a very high frequency, and there is a trust element that just organically materializes from these exercises that really drives referral business. Uh, the vast majority of the biggest deals we do in any given year is always from networking referrals or customer referrals. Yeah, those are the best, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Because they'll point you towards, they, they give the example. You mentioned about the forums. How do you participate in the forums? You know, I, I've seen folks, and this is what I always, this is like my pet peeve when we did have trade shows, like their only use of social media was visit ABC company at booth number one, two, three. And it's like, no, you've got to do more than that. What kind of things do you do in the forums and 
if it's please visit New West at booth number whatever, I apologize for criticizing your your tactic in advance. Um, but I'm guessing you don't do that. Please tell me you don't. No, we, we do not do that. And, and actually, I do like the fact that uh, the the farms have become a lot more regulated than they used to be, uh, where you know self promotion is is heavily controlled. You cannot. Uh, go out there and just tout yourself over and over. Uh, oftentimes, you know, in, in my personal experience, I've found that if, if you help others, others just gravitate toward you naturally uh, because they're, they're always going to be junior partners in any industry. And uh, we have been very fortunate uh, to be a, a leader in, in, in just about the market success that we actually service. Uh, so when it comes to, you know, whether it's payments, uh, whether it's, you know, SMB retail, uh, we, we've just done it for, you know, a little over 28 years. And so we know a thing or two about it. So us being able to uh, be mentors to other up and coming partners uh, really puts us in a much more good position to be able to attract others who we did not even do business with who happen to be in the same farm. Now, naturally, in some cases, in the event of assisting someone else, you have an opportunity to uh, project yourself as a subject matter expert. Uh, so those two things kind of happen uh, almost symbiotically and, and, and it creates this give and take that seems to just draw people in. And that has worked for us over the years. And uh, we've written a tremendous amount of uh, blog articles and posts that we actually also publish on our website that are just how to best practices that uh, just other partners can be able to leverage in their own businesses. And that oftentimes allows us to, you know, have people come back and say, hey, I saw you wrote an article about this. Uh, you know, how did you, you know, create success with this? And inevitably, those folks will end up being good referrals and sources. Exactly. I really like how you said, and I wrote it down. If you help somebody, they will naturally gravitate towards you. There's actually a quote that I heard a couple of weeks ago. I put it up on my bulletin board, so I'm looking at it. It's from uh, John Fetterman, who's a lieutenant governor here. I'm in uh, Pennsylvania, and he said, if you're good, help someone else get to good. And I thought that is just a great guiding principle for, for business for humanity you know just in general so if you're good help someone else get to good and, and those folks will gravitate so all right so uh, chris can you get me back from the full uh philosophical uh side of this uh, i'm going to be quoting socrates next um and how do you uh how did star generate referrals what are some uh, effective referral tactics that you've seen or experienced or that you implement yourself okay well, we've had some success with working with our large software houses who are, are trying to expand the reach in the channel and being channel focused, that's what we're all about, keeping the evolution going. As well as we work with our distributors and software houses, connecting them with the resellers. You know, right from integration, you know, we're engaging a salesperson. And, you know, right from that point, we're talking with the customer to say, you know, do you know, you know, do you need the channel? What else do you need? How can we help you? Um, most of the times you find out they don't even know they don't need a channel and by no means do I just want to send them out to the internet to purchase. Okay. I really want to set them up with the great partners and start continuously partners with our distributors and marketing activities, developing new opportunities that we're driving down throughout the channel. Got it. Thank you. Can you uh, dive in a little bit deeper? Cause I know you and I have talked about this before the importance of VARs and ISVs leaning on their vendors, leaning on their distributors, instead of trying to go it alone and figure out, figure things out themselves. Sometimes they recall and they think, oh, this vendor or distributor is going to try to sell me something or push uh, something to me, but they actually want to help, just like we were talking about. Can you talk yeah. about the importance of that? Is there anything you can say to our, uh, to our audience, to our listeners, that you've said to other VARs and ISVs about why they should engage more? with their, their vendor and their distributor to really help them make connections and increase their referrals? You know, you always have someone that's a, they, they got it together. Like they want it, you know, they're just gonna move forward and then they get in the middle of it and then they realize they start to backpedal to say, oh, maybe we are over our head a little bit. Maybe I really don't wanna be involved in the shipping of this, this product. Maybe there is a value of using uh, a, a distributor to keep the inventory, you know, and, and then this way I can focus on what I'm really good at, you know, you know, I can't stress the, you know, with the integration, you know, you have, you have someone, you can't make our product work unless it goes through an integration piece. Okay. So, um, and then those guys, those engineers, they're on, it, it integrates, it works with our software. Let's, let's send it out to the channel. We're ready to go, but where are you sending it to? Okay. So again, bringing them and educating them from the beginning really helps and saves some time and helps them be more, you know, positioned solidly in the market. Yeah, and they realize it's not so scary engaging with the vendor and distributor. Like, they are actually trying to help me. How about that? Yeah. 
Well, good. We're going to pause here. And first, if you like this episode, check out episode three of the Trusted Advisor podcast, where I talk with Jake West of Vend, uh, an RSPA ISV member, and Jason Cowan of Spark Solutions Group, a longtime reseller. And you can get their perspective as well on VAR and ISV business development. I uh, also want to let our listeners and viewers know that an RSPA membership has never been more valuable or affordable. The RSPA has expanded its VAR and ISV member benefits to include discounts on health insurance, HR services, office supplies, and shipping. Also, RSPA members have access to a legal advisor, security advisor, sales coach, and a VAR and ISV business advisor. That's all included in your annual RSPA membership, which a reseller starts at $250 a day. That's just, you don't have to get out your calculator. I'll let you know, 68 cents a day for these high value services. Accelerate your success by joining the RSPA today. Also, thank you to our sponsors who support the RSPA community and make this podcast and video series possible. Our platinum sponsors are Blue Star, Heartland, ScanSource, and Shift4 Payments. To receive the benefits of an RSPA membership or RSPA sponsorship, email membership at gorspa.org. And finally, don't forget to save the date for Retail Now 2021, July 25th and 27th in Nashville. Retail Now is where the industry meets. And as you heard earlier, George said he never misses a Retail Now. So we can also add to our tagline, meet George and Chris Duffy uh, at Retail Now. We'll see if that uh, makes it record attendance and we'll, we'll give you guys all the credit. So uh, definitely looking forward to that event and actually seeing people in 3D form as opposed to flat on a screen. Yeah. Uh, everybody will just be very relieved to do that. Um, well, okay, let's jump back into it. I'm curious overall, and Chris, if you can take this first, what has changed from a sales and a marketing perspective over the past three to five years? I'm curious to get your answer. The reason that I ask this question is there are some folks listening to this who have done this, what they consider tried and true and what they think is most effective for years and years, but maybe there's some things that uh, that have changed and need to catch up with. What would you say has been, from a sales and marketing perspective, what's been the biggest change? Well, three to five years ago, anyone that had any product interest typically contacted us, us through our distributor partners or were a direct result from face-to-face -face events or meetings. Today, product info, price, part numbers are all available online through many merchants, and start distributors are now delivering pricing and availability through EDI feeds. No reason to call them anymore. Digital marketing is much more prevalent now with consistent email communication, social networking, webinars, and communication tools have been generational, but we still use the phone, and you should be leveraging all communication methods, email, text, Zoom, Z Teams, whatever your preference is, but most important is the frequency of your messaging and developing that relationship. The world is moving so fast and change is happening so quickly. Your name and brand has to always stay out in front of your customers and prospects. And that's why we use every method of communication platform available today. Got it, yeah, way more communication channels to manage. George, how about from your perspective, what's changed from sales and marketing past three to five years? I mean, just look at what we're doing now. Uh, I know we're sitting here on a, a video chat, uh, which is not <laughs> something that we would have probably envisioned doing three to five years ago. Uh, no. So it's, it's it's changed just how we communicate. And I think, uh, you know, right now as as just technology has shifted and it's just become so commonplace, the technology that is most effective is that which actually gets to your phone. Uh, and so we try to you know do as much of that as possible and to get the content to where the eyes are closest to it. And uh, just about everyone has a, a communication device, whether they're sitting in front of a PC or Mac for that matter, uh, or they have the phone in their hand. Uh, so we, we, you know, the way people consume information I've seen has really changed over the last three or five years. Uh, uh, folks really don't tend to, you know, go for deep dive contents oftentimes. Uh, they want to just digest very, you know, digestible bits of information. And so the way you, you know, craft your messaging and the way you deliver that message, uh, obviously, it has to be digital in, in many cases to be effective, uh, whether it's, you know, email or if it's uh, a digital ad or whether it's, you know, a, a social media post or whether it's a blog post or, uh, you know, anything that is digitally uh, delivered, uh, it has to be brief and to the point. And, um, and I think what probably has changed also is we, we have shifted more from an academic sales approach to where, I, you know, I remember 15, 20 years ago when we were leading with just expertise, you know, and so you you led with your resume. And uh, that perhaps is maybe what's changed the most. 
where now folks really relate to content that is more about storytelling, that human is the solution. And so if you want to have an effective solution, you demonstrate it or speak about it or engage it in a manner that folks actually see the human feeling about it. And that is what will allow them now to be able to receive that message. Because again, it's, it's a lot more personal than it used to be. Uh, you know, you could do a sales seminar and you talk to 200 people and you might walk away with, you know, a couple dozen opportunities. And that would be a successful event 10 years ago. Uh, now you have to be able to reach a lot more folks uh, because there is so much more content out there and you have to find a way to differentiate your message from the masses. So that, that's the approach that we've taken. Got it. Interesting. Thank you for that. And so, George, I'll stick with you. What hasn't changed? What has really withstood the test of time from a sales and marketing standpoint? Telephone. <laughs> <laughs> so that has not changed. Uh, I could tell you uh, some of the most touching messages that I receive or feedback uh, just from uh, sales reps that we have or, you know, personally. If someone reaches out and, uh, and, and responds to something that you put out, uh, you send out a newsletter, somebody calls you, your responsiveness to that engagement will make or break that sale. Uh, because if if you're the first one that they get to, when they call you and you pick up the phone, you will almost always get them. If you don't, they will move on. By the time you get to them, they've already talked to someone else and somebody else is, is having the kind of opportunity that you wish you had. So the phone communication will probably never go away. And uh, the responsiveness is, is really what makes or breaks uh, how best you leverage the opportunity in front of you. And let me ask you, have you experienced, I've heard some people say this, the younger generation, they don't want to talk on the phone. Is that like painting it with too broad a brush? Or maybe you say, I haven't hung out with the younger generation to be able to answer that question. I guess just from your experience, you see anybody who has an aversion to talking on the phone, George? And that may very well be true for B2C engagements. You know, so if you're selling to consumers, uh, then, you know, most consumers will, uh, <laughs> because then you have to, you know, kind of really do social media. You have to really digitize literally everything. Uh, from, we do, you know, most B2B. And so B2B phone uh, sales is still uh, the primary mechanism to which you would do business. Uh, it is also not uncommon that folks would obviously just, you know, go to your website and essentially just procure, you know, whatever your, your wares are. Uh, and they could be able to do it that way. But oftentimes, uh, we live in a world of consultative sales. You know, and no one is just going to go out there and just buy a system that is going to, you know, cost, you know, six figures uh, without having to talk to someone. Believe me, you will have to talk to them. So uh, that has not changed. And uh, how you perfect the way you manage that process, uh, you know, really you know, separates you from the others. Yeah, you're not going to text somebody, would you like to buy a full e-commerce enabled <laughs> system? Here is the price and wait for... I wish it was that easy. <laughs> yeah, but it, I think that's interesting. <laughs> the distinction you yeah. make, like if your home phone, if people still have home phones, is ringing and you don't know who it is, you're not going to pick it up. But if you've got a business phone and that phone rings, you're not going to be like, I don't know who that is because it might be somebody calling in who wants something and wants to buy something. They might be a referral like we talked about uh, earlier. So I'm glad you made that distinction. I'm always nervous about these broad brush, this generation, this, and this generation, that. So I appreciate that, okay. that level of detail, George. And I'll just add a little bit more to that. You know, one thing that has also in my experience just gone away is the concept of a business day. Uh, you, know, you know, it used to be, you know, we used to, you know, really work from nine to five or whatever your business hours were. That has just gone away. Business happens when it happens. It could be Saturday morning. It could be Sunday night. It could be Tuesday night. Business happens all the time. That is, has been probably maybe the biggest shift. Uh, you have to be available. And if you're not, somebody else will. Yep, good point. And because we all have the phones in our pockets, we're always available and can always pick up and, and email back and all that. So, well, good. I, so, uh, Chris, uh, from your perspective, what hasn't changed? Again, what are those sales marketing tactics, principles, methodologies uh, that are still true today than they were 5, 10, 15 years ago? Okay, well, George, I couldn't agree with you more any more than a lot of, I'm spot on and I'm 100% in agreement with you. In marketing, they call it targeted marketing, but in sales, I call it the personal touch, just as you mentioned. We expect our team to call and talk to customers. Um, it's our way of taking care of our community of partners. Stars effectively manages and continues to strengthen our distribution channel as the distribution is the core of our success. 
working with our diligently and learning the pain of our partners and resellers to make sure that they're profitable and are, are able to compete against online reselling platforms has been essential. We understand the value of the partners. We know how hard it takes to make a good part, you know, a partnership, and we want to make sure it's recognized. Having the vision and tag, having a vision and tagline period has really been, uh, you know, an advancement for us. And our ours is always leading, always innovating, has been a guiding force, which has really produced results that people recognize and come to expect from Star. Trade shows, you know, we keep talking about trade shows. They're gonna, they're gonna again going to resume. They will continue as a lead generator, but it's ne was necessary to shift our focus. We believe when they return. They will be well attended and proved to withstand the test of time as well. Yeah, and Chris, I, I appreciate you saying that, especially emphasizing that personal touch. Is there uh, anything that you can say to the VARs and ISVs listening? Because a lot of them are dealing with folks who are from out of town or purchase off the internet or things like that. What things have you seen, what tactics have been effective to be more personal and emphasize that personal touch and, and that communication to to succeed and win and, and to get that business because sometimes those out of town people's internet people are way cheaper uh, but you know you can use your personal touch to the advantage well I guess what advice would you have for them what have you seen you know but going you're going online for convenience okay you're not going online for advice okay you're not even sometimes going online to pay the cheapest okay. You're going online because they have your credit card and it's easier to buy. You know, it's not going to get hacked. Okay. Um, but really trying to engage with our partners. I mean, speaking to the resellers and, and, and learning what pain that they've had, you know, and think of how they've had, how they, I put myself in their shoes and them having to reposition themselves to combat what was going on with the online world. Okay. And the value in the, the sales um, investments that they made in their team, um, you know, the financial investments they made in their team um, to make sure they were compliant, okay? Um, this is stuff that you're not gonna get when you're going online, okay? So really to understand the pain is real important and, and, and make sure that we're supporting them and, and learning from them, you know, it's a give and take, you know, I learn from them as much as they learn from me. And it seems like there's a big thing of you have to make sure fundamentally, I was actually just having this conversation with an RSPA member because we do, we call it a customer health checkup. It's a merchant survey that we do for them. No charge for RSPA members. We help them uh, survey their customers. The first few questions are about the product. And one thing we talked about is if your product is good, your customer service has a chance of being good. But if your product isn't good, even if you have the greatest customer service people in the world, because of the sheer volume of problems they're going to have to deal with, people are going to feel the customer service uh, is, isn't is good. And so I almost think like it, it's so much better. You can have a personal connection if you're not selling a commodity, right? If you're in the commodity world, what do people care about personal connections, right? Like when I bought, again, using the phone as the example, or when I got a cup, actually, I got this as a gift from somebody. So maybe that's not the best example in the world, but you don't care about the relationship, but if it's something more complex and that's, it seems like a message to folks. And I, I know Star and New West both do that. You guys really elevate what you offer. You're not, you're not selling commodities. So um, just, I'll get off my soapbox uh, for that. Just a couple more questions uh, uh, left related to, to sales. So uh, Chris, we'll stick with you on this. Can you talk about changes related to sales and business development that our listeners should expect to see in 2021 and beyond? And I guess, how is Star adjusting its strategies and tactics to maximize sales over the next 24 months? Okay, well, that, that's a big, those are some tall orders I wish I knew, but I believe the return to what we knew before is gonna be very slow, okay? New habits have now been established and they're not gonna disappear. I personally miss the face-to-face -face communication and the hustle and bustle of traveling but really have learned to appreciate the value from working from home as many distractions have been eliminating, allowing for more productivity and more collaboration. Although many stores and restaurants close, I really believe 2021 will be a great year for the implementation of the omni-channel platforms, whether it's new stores or older, older ones, this change is recognized as, as an alternative needed for a brand survival. An investment needs to be made. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Before I pose that question to George, I know, Chris, you were worried. We talked about before we press record about your dog barking uh, <laughs> during this, and your dog just started. We just have to know what's your dog's name. 
Oh, that's Bailey. Bailey? All right, he very nice. Knows well, the mailman's coming into town, so he's right out that door looking at him. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that Bailey's there, made himself heard, and uh, I'm glad that he's there protecting you. Uh, good, good watchdog there. So, yeah. all right, uh, George. Uh, yeah, all what's your answer? Of them, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And so, George, how are you? How's New West adjusting strategies and tactics to maximize your sales uh, over the next 24 months in this new world? Just like uh, Chris has alluded to there, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, the, the, di the diminishing nature of in-person advances uh, certainly caused uh, said people like us to change our strategies. Uh, we, uh, if this was not the awakening that we needed, uh, it certainly got us there. Uh, we have uh, shifted our focus now to uh, a lot more, you know, pandemic-proof type of uh, marketing segment. So we have to now think of uh, which businesses really survived and thrived in this pandemic. And how can we, you know, align ourselves appropriately to make sure that we do more business with such verticals? Uh, naturally, you know, related businesses, you know, always survive any recession, any pandemic. Uh, if you're selling to beer, wine, liquor folks, if you're selling to, you know, folks who sell tobacco or cannabis, uh, those industries have really, really thrived in this pandemic. Uh, healthcare segments, uh, mobile tech. Uh, so we're really, you know, focusing on making sure that we do a lot more with those verticals. Grocery has been um, uh, a retail sub vertical that we have not proactively marketed into. Uh, we react to it. Uh, we don't chase it. We do now. Uh, and so because we, we have now uh, really seen just how they double, triple the businesses. They were having Black Friday type sales in February and have not had uh, any drops since then till now. And uh, so those are the types of businesses that we really want to make sure that we are very deeply embedded in. Uh, because they will survive any recession. Folks still have to eat. And, uh, you know, in the vice industries, people inevitably will escape to whatever they can to be able to make the pain less impactful. Uh, so, you know, people will always buy a glass of wine or a bottle of their favorite drink or whatever the case may be. And those retailers need us now more than ever. And those are the, those are the folks that are making our phones run. So we want to do more with those verticals that truly can survive and we want to survive with them uh, because we all have to adapt. We must change as as change, you know, drives us in different directions. Yeah, and as we talked earlier about from a commodity standpoint, I know, I know I've talked to some resellers and they say, I provide this and these commodity people are knocking me, uh, you know, off these business stuff, so I'm losing these deals. It's like, well, maybe you should focus up a line right from your vertical market that you're in. If you're playing in the lower end of whatever it is, hospitality or retail or, or anything right. like that, and commodities are eating away, well, then maybe you need to get to a a different market. Yeah, if you don't mind me, George, asking. So, uh, you know, we're fascinated here with uh, the cannabis market. Can you share any insights in terms of how you got into that market and uh, what that's yielding for you? I know it's not something that uh, New West just got into in 2020. It's been uh, quite a while in the making. Can you talk about? Because if we're given the advice of, you know, search for markets that are really going to be a higher yield for you. Uh, any insights you can give in terms of how you chose that market and things that you're doing to maximize? It? Uh, certainly. Uh, so just like, you know, with most industries, uh, the moment a new vertical or sub vertical pops up, uh, the flood gets just open. Everybody just, you know, chases it. And there is a little bit of very fast saturation uh, that almost happens almost immediately. Uh, no different than any other vertical. Cannabis was just bombarded with uh, software publishers who uh, mostly emerged from a compliance perspective. Uh, you know, think of folks who, you know, previously sold systems to pharmaceuticals uh, or the medical industry, where these are heavily regulated industries. Uh, traditional POS bars just didn't play in that segment because they would they had plenty of business to chase in conventional uh, retail, be it apparel or be it or other subsectors. Cannabis has a very unique, uh, you know, requirement because it has a, a primary compliance component, and then it has the the the, the second part of it, which is the forgotten part, it's just the traditional retail, a uh, very robust, uh, you know, a supply chain logistics channel. And so we came in with the retail expertise that seemed to be a gap in the traditional VAR selling into that space. A lot of the software publishers who entered that space reactively didn't have the retail background. So they had the compliance components, but the, the, the depth of the retail offering was always shallow. And that is really where we found a good footing to be able to differentiate ourselves, as you probably know, in any industry, you have to focus on differentiation marketing, uh, because when otherwise you just a me too. If you just have something that everybody else has, uh, then there's no way for folks to know what's new or different about you, and you always have to stay ahead of it because naturally, in the technology space, folks 
they replicate what they see people having success with. And so you can only have a leading edge for so long until you create a new standard. Yeah. So I think I've been, been able to uh, come in with uh, over 25 years of retail experience, uh, put us in really good position to separate ourselves from uh, some of the folks who are just coming from a compliance perspective. And uh, we would in a little win over uh, those customers who are now in their second or third round of POS systems, really finding one that actually addressed the fundamentals of retail and obviously had the compliance bits that they need to operate their business uh, from a legal perspective. So th that really was our secret sauce. And, and we have continued to try to create that separation from some of those other industry solutions in that way. Yeah, there's one level keeping them compliant, but if you're able to then show them how to run a better operation and then grow exactly their right. sales, like that's mm -hmm. that's hugely, hugely helpful. Chris, before I ask you the same question, just so you know, so even though I work in an office park, uh, the mailman must be here as well because the dog is barking. Uh, somebody brought their dog in today and I can hear him, hear him out in the hallway. So um, it's glad, glad that it's a dog day here uh, on the podcast. So Chris, if you can talk for a little bit about, you know, hunting new verticals from a star perspective and making sure that you're riding a wave. I know John Levin on your team, uh, you know, has looked into the cannabis vertical as well. You're always looking for those new up and coming ISVs. I guess, what color can you add to that in terms of the importance of even these giant vendors, you know, like yourself, maybe especially a giant vendors looking for these new opportunities, these new verticals to see what's around the corner. No, we're always trying to stay ahead of the wave. Okay. Um, you know, even with the whole online, the, the world that switched overnight to online ordering and, uh, the curbside pickup, you know, this is something that we really focus on and we really try to be tech more tech technology advanced than our competition. You know, it's just, we have a vision and a foresight to stay ahead of the wave. Okay. You don't want to get trampled by it. And so, you know, we got in, we were one of the earliest adopters into that, into the cannabis industry. You know, we had the retail, you know, retail was our, was our focus. You know, we had great components, you know, to a great printer to support that market. But as you know, that market and all the other markets, we really felt like the ease of integration was what it was all about. Okay. And of course the quality of, to back it up, but you know, that's why we really built out our component subset of what we offer right? to make it convenient, um, to make it seamless, you know, one integration package to integrate the cash drawer, the scanner, a scale, whatever it may be, you know, is all something that I offer and it's all from uh, one company to make it easier for these, um, for, for, our, for our resellers. Got it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And you've got to make sure that you don't just wait for opportunities to come to you. You have to go find them out. That kind of seems to be a theme uh, that Chris and George, you, you both you both share there. And also, if I can give a plug for Star, uh, they are one of the sponsors for 2021 of the new RSPA cannabis community. So we appreciate uh, your, your support there. So my last question uh, for both of you, uh, and this is going to be the last question that I ask on the podcast this year because it's our final episode. Wow. We'll start with you, Chris. Uh, can you recommend for our audience a book to read, an online resource to follow, a podcast to listen to that's going to help them improve uh, their organization? And if your dog you know, wants to join us, that's candy, fantastic. But I, I certainly have to have the plug for the walk on that. Okay? I know there's a couple copies in your office as well. Chris, Chris, is, Chris, is, holding, Chris is holding up a copy of my book. So. So mine's personally signed, but really um, getting things done by David Allen has been um, a great read for the procrastinator in us all. Um, and the HubSpot blog is relatively new to me, but really it's a, it's it has been a great tool for developing marketing strategies, sales plans, KPIs, and much more. So it's kind of, you know, and it's free. Yeah, so getting things done by David Allen and then the HubSpot blog, uh, good ones. We'll look into those. Uh, George, uh, what would you recommend for audience? What's a good resource? Uh, Chris just one up me there, which is truly unfortunate because you know hers is signed. Uh, Jim, we need to have a sidebar about that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> might have <been. laughs> But I got it on Amazon. It'll be the best twenty dollars you've ever spent. So I, I, I appreciate that. Please, please leave a review. <laughs> we'll do. We'll do. All right. So I'd say uh, I had a couple of good ones. Uh, Winning Retail is a podcast that you're probably very familiar with. Uh, uh, Tony Saldana does a good show. Uh, and uh, they happen to bring on a lot of industry retail giants. Uh, because sometimes uh, when we look at some of the industry giants, you know, he brings the likes of, you know, P&G and the Walmarts and all the big guys who really create the trends. 
uh, that you know, essentially the rest of the world follows. And you go to a show like NRF, you, you see what the big dogs are doing. And, uh, and then you really begin to find a way to, uh, you know, craft that message and bring it down to a, a, you know, a consumable, you know, message for mid-market and even SMB, depending on who you're servicing. Uh, let's say uh, Total Retail Talks. I don't know if you're familiar with those guys there in Philly. Uh, they also have a pretty good podcast that I would certainly uh, encourage someone who has a little bit of time to check in. Now, they bring their message more for best practices. So they kind of focus a little bit more on that. And I think it's it's good for folks who are really just trying to stay plugged into the retail uh, ecosystem just to find out uh, what's new, what's trending, and you know where can they position themselves best. Uh, now, you know, in many cases, you'll hear a lot of things that you know. In many cases, you'll hear a lot of things that are just new or a twist to something that you thought you knew that it has a modern spin. Uh, so I think that ends up being a good one. As you probably know, Jim, uh, we're huge fans of uh, the trusted advisor. Uh, we are very embedded. We, we can't run away from RSPA even if we tried uh, because all the folks who we interface with, they're all very embedded in RSPA. And so uh, we have really enjoyed just uh, interacting with you as often as possible. And I, I personally would like, you know, I would strongly encourage anybody who has even a few minutes to spare to take a look at your podcast. Well, I, I definitely appreciate you saying that about the RSPA uh, content. Um, I know when I talked to folks a couple years ago, uh, RSPA members and said, what can we do better? One of them actually said, I want you to be in my face. I want you to have content, best practices, lessons, and I want you to be in my face in my business every day. I'm like, well, giving us permission to do that, like, let's go ahead and do it. So, yeah, no, and we really appreciate that. Uh, George, thanks for the kind words about the RSPA content, but it's really all based on uh, the community. I, I read a note on my bulletin board over here earlier. I'll read one over to my right, and it talks about mobilizing the expertise of others and sharing collective wisdom. And that's really what we've tried to do through this podcast, through the RSP blog, through our community IQ. Uh, and so it's folks, uh, George, like you, uh, folks like you, Chris, sharing your wisdom really help uh, make this content as strong as it's been uh, throughout 2020. And we plan on continuing that into 2021. So, well, that's all the time that we have for today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion today. And we also hope you enjoyed all our episodes this year here in 2020 on the RSP Trusted Advisor. If you did like what you heard, be sure to subscribe to the RSP YouTube channel and the Trusted Advisor podcast so you never miss an episode. We'd also appreciate if you'd rate us wherever you find your favorite podcast. My personal philosophy, the more stars, the better. And if you'd like to learn more best practices for virus and ISVs in the point of sale channel, check out the RSP blog. You can find it at gorspa.org and then clicking on RSPA blog. Before we go, thanks so much again to Chris Duffy and George Mouché for sharing their wisdom with us today. Thanks also to RSPA marketing manager, Chris Arnold for his production work, Joseph McDaid for our music, and last but not least, thanks so much to you for listening. Our goal at the RSPA is to accelerate the success of our members in the point of sale ecosystem by providing knowledge and connections. For more information, please visit our website at gorspa.org. Thanks for listening today. Thanks for listening this year. And goodbye, everybody.